Hello, my name is Dr. Carolyn McCune, and this is Step by Step, where we take practitioners through important veterinary conditions and issues step by step. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most common adverse events that occurs under anesthesia, arousal or breakthrough pain. If this sounds like something you experience in your own clinic, then please join me so we can go through the algorithm I use to address this commonly reported adverse event. Did you know that arousal or breakthrough pain is the most commonly reported adverse event under anesthesia with an incidence of up to 15%? If we're to see such an event, we wanna have an algorithm we can take the patient through so we can help them and assist them during this process. Things that may be useful for us to discuss before we go down the algorithm pathway are some definitions. Pain is a conscious perception and is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such associated damage. Therefore, the anesthetized patient who is not conscious does not experience true pain. The same pathways are utilized, but are more appropriately referred to as noxious stimuli because this is an unconscious perception utilizing those nociceptive pathways. A certain amount of information needs to be collected before the anesthetic event. Our very first step in this is going to be verifying what the patient's baseline blood pressure is. Because increased nervousness can contribute to a higher blood pressure than we would normally see, we're going to want a patient to either have acclimatized to the clinical setting or to have sedation on board before we collect that baseline blood pressure. We can obtain those measurements with simple tools, uh, either a Doppler and a sphygmomanometer as well as a cuff, or we can use our oscillometric unit to be able to measure that. If we haven't addressed what we've seen visually, in other words, a patient who has a lot of anxiety before we collect that blood pressure information, we may get an artificially elevated blood pressure measurement. And this brings in the importance of measuring blood pressure in triplicate. So once we have got that initial blood pressure measurement, we may repeat that two to three more times to ensure that the value that we're getting is not because the animal feels uncomfortable with having equipment attached to them or anxious because we're handling them now where they were lying quietly in their cage. Now we're going to talk about the patient that starts to show us the signs of arousal or breakthrough pain. The patient who moves on the table, the patient who may have an increase in respiratory rate is one of the very first signs, and later on have changes in hemodynamics, including that increase in blood pressure as compared to baseline, as well as an elevation in heart rate. In determining what strategy we need to take, our first step is going to be determining what the patient's anesthetic depth is. We're going to want to check the patient's jaw tone, evaluate eye position, and assess for palpebral reflex, as well as factor in those hemodynamic changes, including an elevation in blood pressure as compared to the patient's baseline. If anesthetic depth was deemed to be inadequate, we're going to want to verify that our equipment is working appropriately that our vaporizer is functioning as intended, that it is turned on, that we have the vaporizer filled with our appropriate anesthetic agent, and that oxygen is flowing and thus delivering vaporized agent to the patient. Once we've verified that these pieces are working, we want to make sure our vaporizer setting is appropriate for the patient's level of anesthetic depth. We should have arrived at a patient who is now fully anesthetized and comfortable. If the patient continues to show signs of arousal or breakthrough pain, we're going to want to see whether or not that arousal or breakthrough pain may be due to noxious stimuli. If anesthetic depth seems adequate, we are concerned that there is either arousal or breakthrough pain likely due to noxious stimuli and we want to intervene. My very first objective question is, when did the patient last receive premedication? Sometimes those numbers can surprise us. We've all had things happen to us during a day where we have 
administered pre-medication to an animal and we've had another patient that has had pressing needs, we've had a client phone call that we needed to attend to, and all of a sudden we end up having more of a delay than we would have subjectively thought was present. And so taking those objective variables and looking at timing as a methodology to determine when we need to repeat the pre-medications helps to keep us on the straight and narrow for making sure that we have an anesthetic plane that's adequate for the animal. If pre-medication was given more than two hours ago, we may need to repeat the opioid component of the pre-medication to arrive at a patient who is now fully anesthetized and comfortable. If it was less than two hours since we've given pre-medication, we might consider adding in an alternative analgesic. My first go-to technique is going to be a local or regional anesthetic technique, and that is also best done preemptively before we have the potential for pain or discomfort for this patient. If that regional block has failed, we will consider the alternative use of a constant rate infusion. Opioids, ketamine, and lidocaine are all great choices. Hopefully at this point, we arrive at a patient who is fully anesthetized and comfortable for the rest of their procedure. Thank you for joining us for Step by Step. For more information, please visit vetfolio.com or my personal website, mythosvet.com or take a look at our recently published second edition textbook, Small Animal Anesthesia Techniques, for this and other commonly reported adverse events.